from KSAT 12. The night beat starts right now. Neighbors in an east side community anxious and frustrated after a young man was shot and killed at an apartment complex. San Antonio police say it happened this afternoon at a complex off Bins Engelman. The night team's Daniela Ivara tells us tonight police are still trying to figure out what happened. It's beyond this yellow tape is a difficult sight for this mom to take in. This this is heartbreaking. This is too close. She says she lives a few buildings away from this crime scene. Police say a young man, likely a teenager, was shot and killed after one o'clock this afternoon. They found his body in the parking lot of the artisan at Salado Falls apartment homes. I just feel so sorry for that mom and dad and, and sisters and brothers and aunties. Investigators say people heard about five gunshots. They found several nine millimeter casings nearby. Police hope to find more clues from neighbors' cameras. The youth is all like stirred up. This deadly shooting is an example of why this dad says he worries for his own kids. My daughters don't go about, don't do nothing, not in this. He's upset this young man will never get to grow up. It is frustrating because who do we got to lean on? These parents hope there's a solution to save young lives. I think they need to quit letting these kids get a hold of these guns. This is just ridiculous. It really is. Danielle Kelly Barra, KSAT 12 News. 11 year old Audrey Cunningham is still missing four days after she was last seen in Livingston, Texas. Her parents dropped the little girl off at her bus stop on Thursday morning, but they say she never made it to school, triggering that Amber Alert you might have seen. Since then, a person of interest in her disappearance has been arrested on an unrelated charge. Polk Can County deputies say 42 year old Don Stephen McDougall's car may have been involved in her disappearance. Audrey's backpack was also found near a dam in town. Despite no sign of Audrey, her community is not giving up on finding her. There's always hope. That's what we pray for. The safe return of Audrey to her family. There is already a $7,000 reward for information leading to finding Audrey. If you see her or know where she is, just call the Polk County Sheriff's Office immediately. Plans for a new park in a northwest Bear County community is putting some neighbors on edge. Crime is high all over the county and a new BCSO substation just opened in that area. Now, Some neighbors told the night teams Avery Everett they think the park will lead to more crime. So we took those concerns to the sheriff. If you listen closely, you can hear the leaves rustling in this northwest Bear County neighborhood. But if you listen even closer, the only sound coming this way is cars speeding down Tally Road. Things are growing and uh, uh, developing. Tensions are high on this side of town as neighbors discuss a proposed county park. For those against it, a big concern is crime. The county is short staffed as it is, and they're not going to have the manpower to protect the community that surrounds this park. Break-ins and burglaries seem to feel more common. Our neighborhood is plagued with car theft. On this side of town, there are so many open house and new development signs plastered around the neighborhood. And that's why the sheriff says it's so important that they opened up this substation. Even if it's just one room inside a fire station, he says it's all about connecting his department with a community that's quickly growing. We're absolutely going to need more. In the meantime, this is a pretty good bridge. It's been nearly a month since the Bear County Sheriff's Office opened its Northwest substation. These are our score deputies that are working the area right now. They're working on some information on, on a couple of the homeless encampments that they've identified in there. He says his deputies are focused on homelessness and crimes of opportunity right now. But responding to calls all comes down to resources. It's, it's certainly not that they're not being heard. It's do we have the resources to do it? The substation may be small, but the sheriff says it's a step. Now that we have this influx of, of 37 new patrol deputies hitting the streets here before too long, that's what's going to give us the ability to police more effectively. The county park is a growing debate in a growing community. We do not want the crime that is going to go along with having a walking trail. There's, there's always going to be crime, but again, it's, it's the community coming together. She's working out of here to identify some. And the, the sheriff says his priority is just keeping up with current safety concerns. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you, Avery. All right, switching gears to a look outside with live cam right now. Temperatures falling pretty efficiently. We are already in the mid 40s here in San Antonio. What a weekend. Yesterday it was cold, it was windy. We had a light freeze in San Antonio earlier this morning, but after that, plenty of sunshine made for a nice afternoon. And it was pretty cool with high temperatures in the upper 50s. Looking ahead to our President's Day, not expecting a freeze here in San Antonio, mid to upper 30s by 7 a.m. tomorrow. Still plenty cold. Cold, you'll want the extra layer in the coat if you're stepping out first thing tomorrow. But after that, even more sunshine is in store. So another nice day in the works. High temperatures a bit warmer than what we saw earlier today, topping off in the upper 60s. Pretty seasonable for this time of year. As we look ahead to the upcoming week, quiet and pretty dry. That's going to be the theme of our weather pattern over the next several days. Warming up quickly, a little taste of spring near 80 by the middle of the week. Also, we will be monitoring for some rounds of morning fog as early as Tuesday. We're going to time it all out, get you those details coming up in just a few. Mia, well, churchgoers in Houston returned to Lakewood today for the first time since a woman opened fire inside the church one week ago. Pastor Joel Olstein spoke for the first time uh, about the shooting, saying during today's service how thankful he was for the off-duty officers that took down the shooter last Sunday. Brittany Jeffers from our sister station in Houston spoke to Olstein about what happened after the shooting. Angels were here protecting us. Lord, we know it's not an accident that we're here today alive. Lakewood church pastor and church members say they are sitting here today because they're standing in their faith. Because really what today is about reclaiming, reclaiming what is ours, reclaiming the space that God has provided for all of us to come to worship him. What we experienced last Sunday, it was a real miracle. It was a real miracle. One week ago, police say Janice Moreno walked into the church right before the Spanish service with her seven year old son and an assault style gun and opened fire. Chaos and uncertainty followed with church members fleeing, echoes of gunshots in the background. But today, some of those church members say they needed to return. Did you have any um, hesitation about coming today? Any concern? I had a little bit fear, but uh, God gave me that strength to come back and worship. These are heroes. I'm telling you, if you know the story, it's people that use their God-given talents. Courage rose up in them. They fought fear and they saved us all. At the special service today, Osteen and the head of security at Lakewood credited local law enforcement, church protocols, and off-duty HPD officers and TABC agents who prevented the shooter from getting into the sanctuary. They were heroes. In the face of danger, they went to evil and good prevailed. After the service, I asked Joel Osteen about those safety protocols and if any changes would be made. We are just proud of, of the police and our, our own security here. They, they, were, they were heroes. And so we celebrate what they've done or, or we thank them for what they've done. I think we're always looking, but we have a very strong plan in place. There were also many emotions today in the reflection of what transpired just one week ago. Lord, as well, we lift up that little seven-year-old boy, Samuel, that was injured here, Lord, at, at no fault of his own. Lord, I pray for all the family of the deceased and the troubled woman, Lord, we just pray. Now, Pastor, we saw you get emotional up there today when you were speaking about the shooter, when you were asking and calling on uh, people to pray for her and her family. Can you talk to me about that moment? Yeah, it's just, I don't know, I just get overwhelmed when I think about, you know, I, I feel sorry for the lady that lost her life, you know, she just mentally ill and nobody brings a child that can do yep. stuff like that so it just I guess I just feel the hurt there and it's not it wasn't tears of fear or anything like that I don't know it's, I guess it's just pretty overwhelming to me that was Brittany Jeffers reporting. Now, Houston's police chief says a video from last week and shooting at Lakewood will be released in the coming days. A recent 600 page Department of Justice report is outlining the failures of law enforcement on May 24th, 2022 at Robb Elementary. The DOJ report to the, the pointed out to the 10 key moments that nearly 400 officers could have and should have stopped the killing. Our case that investigates team has poured over hours of body camera and surveillance video to bring you those moments as they happened. Dude, we gotta get in there. Yeah. The DPS is in the we gotta get in there. He's keep shooting. We gotta get in there. 
The full case on Investigate story from multiple angles coming up in about 20 minutes. And here are a few reminders before primary voting gets underway. Next Friday is the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot. Early voting for the primary begins next week on Tuesday, February 20th, and Election Day is on March 5th. We have more information on voting locations and a sample ballot you can look at right now on KSAT.com. Well, coming up, a report from Russia where hundreds are being detained following the death of one of Vladimir Putin's top political rivals. What U.S. officials have to say about the situation next on The Night Beat. Hundreds of people in Russia have been arrested in the days since the death of Alexei Nawalny. His death um, says he was murdered in a Russian penal colony, and now the Kremlin is refusing to release his body. ABC's Lama Hassan reports he was Vladimir Putin's most notable political opponent. Two days after Alexei Navalny died in a Russian prison colony, tributes continued to pour in. The Russian opposition leader's wife, Yulia Navalny, in her first Instagram post since his death, sharing a photo, writing simply, I love you. The U.S. ambassador to Russia laying flowers at Solovetsky Stone in Moscow, a monument to victims of political repression, posting on social media. Our hearts go out to his family, friends and supporters. His strength is an inspiration. We honor his memory. In St. Petersburg, unidentified people began removing makeshift memorials to Navalny, but the flowers were immediately replaced by supporters lining up to mourn his death. An independent Russian human rights group says hundreds of people have been arrested over the last couple of days. His death on Friday has drawn an international response. U.S. officials laying blame for his death with Vladimir Putin. The death of Alexei Navalny yesterday was a reminder of the extraordinary brutality Putin and his government. Navalny's team says this wasn't a death. They believe he was murdered and that Russian authorities are covering it up, saying this is why they have not yet released his body to his family. The body was taken by uh, investigative committee and they are conducting some sort of investigations. Uh, with him. Navalny's mother and lawyer traveled to the remote prison colony in the Arctic on Saturday. They were told his body will be handed over once a post-mortem examination had been completed. Russian prison officials claim he died of sudden death syndrome. Lama Hassan, ABC News, London. Two officers and a firefighter are dead after being shot while responding to a domestic violence call in Minnesota. Yeah, they were responding to a home just outside of Minneapolis. And that's where a man had barricaded himself from officers with seven children inside. It's unclear what led to that gunfire, but the man inside the home was also gunned down in this incident. All seven children did make it out of the home okay, but Governor Tim Walz says this tragedy will not be over anytime soon. These families are forever impacted, and we still have Minnesotans willing to take an oath, sign up, do the work, and know this can happen. And, and that speaks volumes about this community, speaks volumes about Minnesotans. Several other first responders were hurt and taken to nearby hospitals and are expected to recover. If you or someone you know is in a dangerous relationship, KSAT has a full list of helpful resources on our website. You can just scan the QR code on your screen or go to the domestic violence page on our website. That's KSAT.com slash domestic violence. Today marks one year since former President Jimmy Carter entered hospice care. Now, his grandson, Jason Carter, says the 39th president's spirits are strong as ever. The 99-year-old survived several forms of cancer and health scares in recent years. Carter also survived his wife, Rosalind, who died just three months ago at the age of 96. All right, well, my daughter would not come inside today, so okay. we ended up having to put that puffy jacket yeah. on. It was cold. It's been a while since she used it, I'm sure, right? <laughs> it really was. It was so yes. warm at the end of last week, and it was muggy, and then yeah. we got that cold front that moved in Friday, and yeah, it was definitely a weekend to <laughs> break out the puffy jacket. We're not finished a good with reminder, them. it's still winter. Exactly. We're not putting it away. We're not out of the woods <laughs> just yet. And, of course, that also is in theme with this morning's low temperatures. A very, very cold start to this Sunday. Day. Many 
areas in and around San Antonio starting off at a light freeze. 32 officially over at the airport, 31 in Bulverde. Some parts of the hill country, Kerrville, Comfort, even closer to the Lost Maples area, were able to dip down into the upper 20s to kickstart the day. Now we've gotten a lot of questions. Could this morning's freeze maybe be our last one for the season? Well, we're getting close to the time frame, at least here in San Antonio, down Highway 90 and pointing off farther to the south where the average tells us that we could see that last freeze late February. But as you get into northern Bear County and up into the hill country, on average, that last freeze closer to mid March. So we still have a little bit of time, something of course we will continue to monitor for you, at least here in San Antonio, though, not expecting any more freezes over the next week. Still plenty cold out there. First thing tomorrow, mid to upper 30s here in the Alamo City. Then we really start to warm things back up by Tuesday and even more so Wednesday and Thursday. Low temperatures now above average mid to upper 50s as we start to see a bit more moisture work back in. More on that in just a second. I do want to walk you through your president's day, especially if you still have to step out first thing tomorrow morning. You will want to bundle up, not technically quite as cold as what we saw earlier this morning, but mid to upper 30s expected for most, maybe across portions of the hill country, specifically near Bandera, Kerrville and Comfort. A brief light freeze still possible right around 32 by 7 a.m. 33 in Bulverde, 35 in Nixon, 34 for places like Pleasanton, as well as Poteet to kickstart the day. But much like what we saw today, plenty of sunshine is in store. It's going to be a gorgeous start to the week. 60 degrees already at noon, also a bit warmer into the afternoon. High temperatures topping off in the upper 60s for most of us, right around 68 here in town, 66 over in Seguin, 66 as well up in Bernie and Bulverde. Maybe a few low 70s the farther south and west that you go, 71 for places like Utopia, Savanel, as well as Uvalde. Now, if you liked the chillier weather, I hope that you enjoyed it today because while we already are about 10 degrees warmer tomorrow, check out Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. A warming trend quickly takes over. In fact, a little taste of spring. On Wednesday, we're already approaching that 80 degree mark. I think we're there by Thursday. Then we'll see our next week front move in and drop temperatures back down into the low 70s into next weekend. But also notice we'll start tomorrow monitor for some morning rounds of patchy fog. That's thanks to the addition of a touch more Gulf moisture. We had that front that moved in Friday evening and knocked all of that moisture out of the area. Dew points in the 20s right now, so very comfortable to step out to. We've got high pressure at the surface in place across the Lone Star State right now, but watch what's going to happen over the next couple of days. The center of that high pressure system shifts farther off to the east from where we're positioned in relation to it. Winds then shift in from the southeast and that's going to allow more of that Gulf moisture to start working into at least the southeastern portions of the Lone Star State. So because of that, yes, some patchy morning fog possible daily as early as Tuesday. I wish we had some rain chances to show for some of that moisture moving back in. Unfortunately, no notable rain chances to talk about through the upcoming week. And that really in part is thanks to this high pressure system that's going to be working into the upper levels here keeping things relatively quiet and of course warmer. That's going to be the big story over the next several days. Those high temperatures quickly warming again, low 80s by Thursday here in town. And then we see that weak front drop us ever so slightly into next weekend. So we'll still keep you updated on that. I'll leave you with this. We love our gorgeous sunset photos. This one sent in from Floresville this evening. Beautiful sunset out there on the horizon, guys. And it looks like a beautiful week. Thanks, yes. ma'am. All right, thank you. We will get you a preview of Instant Replay right after this break. All right, so the NBA All-Star Game is all about offense. If you love high-scoring basketball games, then the NBA All-Star Game is right up your alley. For a preview of what's on Instant Replay, here's Larry Ramirez, who has been traveling all over the country. To Came back you. in from Indy this morning. This I'm morning. fresh and ready to go. And I'll tell you what, today was the highest All-Star Game scoring-wise in the history of wow. the contest. So, yes, a lot of scoring. Indianapolis hosted the 73rd NBA All-Star Game and all the festivities that go along with it coming up tonight on Instant Replay. Durant denies that one. George runs it, sets it up for LeBron. There's a highlight for 
LBJ. LeBron James played in this record 20th NBA All-Star game tonight, passing up the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. LeBron said it's very humbling and something he will never forget. It's East versus West in the annual NBA exhibition that features a whole lot of scoring, and tonight they set a new record. I mean, that's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to I wanna win all, all these. So, um, I mean, uh, I don't know which one I'm, I'm going to do next, but I'm going to do something. Spurs rookie Victor Wimanyama did his part in the skills challenge Saturday night in what he hopes is the first of many NBA All-Star weekends for him, but hopefully in the big game itself down the line. Now, what does Wimby have to say about taking over the spotlight once guys like LeBron decide to retire? The highlight. I think just being in the moment and, you know, experiencing it uh, for the second time, um, you know, you can't take it for granted. Jeremy Sohan played in the Rising Stars Challenge, just like Wimby, but Sohan won the Rising Stars Challenge as a member of Team Jalen, while Wimby, who was on Team Pow, didn't advance to the final. That messed up something Wimby and Sohan had planned for the finale of the San Antonio Brahmas held the kickoff event today at the Alamo Dome. And would you like to see the Spurs trade for guard Trey Young? That's our web poll question tonight coming up on Instant Replay. I'm really excited that the Brahmas are back. Me too. Yeah, I know there's a group of us. And yeah. we're, like, they pack, the fans pack. Very cool. Yeah, I very love to hear that. Excited to see more about it. Thanks, Larry. All right, more news and weather right after this. For nearly a month, our KSAT Investigates team has been pouring through a 600-page report from the Department of Justice into the Robb Elementary School shooting. The DOJ identified what it calls 10 instances where hundreds of law enforcement officers present could have and should have stopped the killing, but they did not. Lee Waldman watched hours of surveillance and body camera video to show you each of these moments from multiple angles. In this DOJ report, only elected officials and law enforcement leaders are identified. KSAT has made the decision to name all the body camera video that we're using in this story, as well as anyone that is speaking that we can. I want to warn you, there are sounds of gunshots in this story and other material that some might find disturbing. Two days before the last day of school and hours after families rejoiced at an award ceremony, a teen armed with an AR-15 came into Robb Elementary School and began shooting inside of classrooms 111 and 112. Within minutes, officers arrived. This is the first of 10 moments the Department of Justice report says officers should have intervened and save the children and teachers inside of those classrooms. The report says 11 Uvalde PD and Uvalde CISD officers got on scene at 11.35. Acting UPD Chief Mariano Pargas and UCISD Police Chief Pete Arredondo failed to establish command. Meanwhile, outside. Guys, be careful. He might be in that building. You want to go in there? No, because what if he comes out around? Officers hesitated. With officers on scene, the shooting continues. They retreat. Oh, that's fine! Get inside! Go, go, go! The classroom is my wife's classroom. Okay, what's up? Dude, we gotta get in there. GPS is sitting there. We gotta get in there. He just keeps shooting. We gotta get in there. While officers in the hallway stayed back, more arrived outside. Hey, I love you. We got an active shooter at the school. <laughs> Man, I hope this guy didn't <laughs> shoot your kids, bro. You'll be right next to the school. Tip where he's male subjects in the school on the west side of the building. Uh, he's contained. We got multiple officers inside the building at this time. He believe he's uh, barricaded in one of the uh, one of the offices. I messed up. It's still shooting. Despite being incorrectly identified as a barricaded suspect, radio traffic suggests there are kids and teachers in the classroom. The classroom should be in session right now. The class should be in session, Miss Miller. 19, your status. Ruben, 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 
She says she shot Johnny. Yeah. Officer Ruiz is led out of the hallway by Pargas. Hey, Pete's inside the room with him. Despite dozens of officers in the hallway with shields and long guns, no one makes a move into either classroom. Chief, what? Are we just waiting for more tech, or what's going on? They're going to come in. DPS Ranger. How's the They're going to come in. Outside, officers are breaking windows to evacuate other classrooms. Quickly, sweetheart, quickly. Open the window, guys. Okay. Open the window. It's okay, it's okay, guys, okay. Pull the window. Okay. There's a the teacher, there's a the teacher. Open the window. Cover me, cover me, cover me. The report says at this point, Arredondo insists officers wait until the other rooms near 111 and 112 are cleared. <sighs> Let me know if there's any kids in there or anything. This could be peaceful. Meanwhile, UPD Acting Chief Pargas hears a disturbing dispatch call. He only tells some in the hallway. He is in the room full of victims. Full of victims. Full of victims. Child call 911. The room is full of victims. Child 911. Child 911. He's got victims in there. There's victims in the room with him? A child on the phone, multiple victims. A child just called if they have victims in there. He called 911. I'm going to open the door. Here. See if they'll open it. Yeah. Nope. Around 12.16, as Arredondo tries more keys on other classroom doors, a Department of Public Safety sergeant arrives. Ready for Tell them to wait. Uh, I need to grab my med kit for my thing. They say there's multiple victims in the room. I know. I know. That's what I'm saying. You're, you're right. We have to put those aside right now. In both English and Spanish, Arredondo called out to the gunman, at times using his name. Out of respect to the victims and survivors, and to prevent glorification, KSAT will not air that portion of the video. Can you hear us, sir? Please don't hurt anyone. These are innocent children. I'm so proud of these kids, man. Mm -hmm. They did so well. They did. They Door, I bet you was a mother. Yeah. 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 Even after this conversation, it took more than 10 minutes for officers to breach the room and stop the gunmen. 77 minutes later, only a handful of people were pulled out of the classroom alive. The victims and survivors should never have been trapped with that shooter for more than an hour as they waited for their rescue. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Lee Waldman. Have you ever heard of the Keyhole Club? Yeah, it's just west of downtown, and it was the first racially integrated nightclub in San Antonio. Now tonight, Mason Hickok sits down with a historian to talk about how the club got started in the 1950s. It hasn't been gentrified, and it looks very much the way it did when it originally opened, which I think is beautiful. A teal building off West Poplar Street might not look like much, but it's seen its share of history. Known today as the home of the Cruz Blanca Sociedad Fraternal, the building was known as the Keyhole Club, one of San Antonio's first racially integrated nightclubs. The club's owner, Don Albert, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1908. Music brought Albert to the Alamo City. Lending time as a trumpeteer in several house bands, he turned to managing nightclubs in late 1944 and opened the first version of the Keyhole on the east side at the corner of Iowa and Pine Street. Due to the venue's location not far from Fort Sam Houston, the crowds at the Keyhole were an example of integration. My impression is this, that Don Albert would welcome anybody who came through the door. 
In April 1950, he moved the club to the west side, where the building still stands today. Raids by the San Antonio police and Commissioner George M. Roper stalled operations despite the club's success. In 1951, the keyhole was taken to court for a defective roof. But the whole effort was to attempt to destroy the business. While Albert and his business partner celebrated winning their case, operations at the club began to slow, due in part to more integrated nightclubs and the rise of the television. Albert closed the doors of the keyhole in the mid-1960s. Today, the building still exists as a gathering space for the local community. Soon, the building will bear a historical marker, signifying a history integral to the community even after the music has stopped. Mason Hickok, KSAT 12 News. All right, heading back outside with live cam temperatures falling pretty efficiently still low to mid 40s right now here in the Alamo City. It was a colder than average day from start to finish. Again, we got down to about 32 here in San Antonio early this morning. That's our official low temperature, well below the average of 46, but well above the record of 19 that was set back in the year 1900, a high temperature of 56 degrees below the average of 68, but tomorrow we're going to be pretty close to seasonable, right around 68, the forecast high. Most of us in the 50s, it was 55 in Kerrville, 58 in New Braunfels. A few locations were able to hit that 60 degree mark, specifically 61 in Catula, 60 out west in Del Rio. Again, we will continue to warm things up very quickly over the next several days, seasonable tomorrow, and then spring-like as we head into the middle of the week before our next front works in and brings in another milder air mass as we look ahead to next weekend. So we'll talk a little bit more about why this particular week is expected to stay pretty dry and why those temperatures will continue to rise right after the break. All right, well, welcome back. It is getting chilly out right now, yeah. very mm -hmm. much like what it was yesterday. Yep, it's going to be another cold start tomorrow. But if you are a spring weather lover, mm -hmm. the next couple of days, going to be just for you because that's <laughs> going to be the big headline. Yes, right. we're really quiet. Unfortunately, no notable rain chances, but temperatures really going to ramp up quickly. So let's take a look at those weather headlines. That's the big one nearing 80 degrees by the middle of the week. As we start to see a little bit more moisture work in by Tuesday, I think some daily morning rounds of patchy fog will be possible in between that Tuesday to Thursday time frame. And then, of course, a dry weather pattern with no rain chances over the next seven days. I do want to talk about why that is. Get you a little bit more of a breakdown when it comes to what's happening in the upper levels of the atmosphere in the days ahead. You can see right now across South Central Texas, nothing really going on. Mostly clear skies in place. It is chilly and with those clear skies in the works, temperatures will continue to drop through the overnight. As we zoom this out and take a look at what's happening across the lower 48, there's an area of low pressure moving across the deep south. Out ahead of that, some scattered rain and across portions of Florida. Another low pressure system approaching the New England states. Some snow there closer to New York as well as Pennsylvania. Across the west coast, another low pressure system approaching San Francisco, Los Angeles, plenty of rain there near California. But this is the system that we're watching here at home. This area of high pressure that's currently southwest of Mexico. Watch what happens as we advance this on in time. Really by the middle of the upcoming week, this high pressure system is gonna start to affect us here in the state of Texas. You can see by the potential rainfall accumulation, that's just riding around the northern edge of that high pressure system. So that leaves us, unfortunately, here in San Antonio, across the state of Texas, and much of the central plains on the drier side. So that's why we don't have any notable rain chances to talk about. Hopefully we can get another pattern change here in the works as we head into next week. At least we did find some decent rounds of rain to kick off the year in January. And then of course, earlier this month. Temperature wise across the region, yeah. Yes, chilly, as Patty mentioned earlier, 45 here in the Alamo City right now, 41 in Kerrville as well as Rock Springs, 47 off to our southwest in Catula. It's currently 44 out east in Gonzales. With those clear skies in place, calmer winds. Remember yesterday, very windy. We had wind gusts upwards of 25 to 35 miles per hour. Did not have to deal with that today. And winds are still going to be relatively calm heading into your President's Day tomorrow. So those calmer winds, clear skies, dry air, 
allowing those temperatures to fall into the 30s for most of us by wake up time tomorrow. Maybe a few low 40s, especially out west, closer to the Rio Grande for places like Eagle Pass as well as Del Rio. But also like today, more sunshine is in store, making for a great start to the week. 57 and 11 a.m., 67 degrees by 3 o'clock. High temperatures in the upper 60s to low 70s. A little bit warmer the farther south and west that you go. Upper 60s here in Bear County pointing off to the north as well as the east. We mentioned that moisture that's going to start to work back in tomorrow. Still very comfortable. Dew points down, but that's going to change by Tuesday and Wednesday. Then we'll see that next week front work in here and allow a little bit more of that drier air to move back in as well. So tomorrow we've got that sunshine in place, but then as we start to see those winds shift in from the southeast, more of that Gulf moisture starts to work in as well. What you're seeing here by Tuesday morning, that's that patchy fog potential. So already by Tuesday, Wednesday and into Thursday, probably a good idea to just think about setting aside a little bit of extra time to get out the door to get to where you need to be because we could see some pockets of lowered visibility, but then by midday each day we are expecting that to lift on out of here and a bit more sunshine is expected into the afternoons and of course those warming temperatures mid 70s already by Tuesday upper 70s nearing 80 as we head into Wednesday and Thursday. Then we see that weak front move in ahead of next weekend. Overnight lows come down a little bit chilly, especially by Saturday morning upper 40s near 50 high temperatures back in the 70s. Also do want to mention the countdown is on now putting this on your radar 50 days away from the total solar eclipse happening on Monday, April 8th. Ksat.com slash eclipse has a ton of articles we've already put together with some great info if you want to check it out, guys. We know how hard you guys have been working on that. It's amazing. We're so excited. We are so <laughs> excited. It's going to be glasses fun. glasses ready. I, I mean, know. You got to get ready now. I got lucky. I sit by the meteorologist. So I, already, <laughs> I already stashed a couple glasses. All right. Thanks, Mia. Well, two new movies are stepping in to give the slumping box office some life. The early estimates for the top five films in theaters this weekend. What wondrous love is this? The second installment of season four of The Chosen, episodes four through six, debuted in fifth place with $3.4 million. The animated adventure Migration rose to fourth place on ticket sales of $3.8 million. Argyle fell to third place, taking in $4.7 million. <laughs> The superhero origin story, Madam Web, opened in second place, grossing $15.2 million. With Jarman, the thing that Jarman was a thing of the past. Bob Marley, One Love, a look at the reggae icon, was jamming with $27.7 million, easily debuting number one. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. So excited. To see that one. <laughs> so excited. Now that the NFL season is over with the UFL is up next, and that means the San Antonio Brahmas will start up their season soon. Very excited for that, too. And we are five weeks away from the first ever San Antonio Sports All Star Basketball game. For a preview of what's on instant replay, let's check in with Larry Ramirez. And I can't help but think that maybe one day we'll see a handful of these young men or women in the NBA yes. and or the WNBA and perhaps the All Star games. For those leagues, right? So 120 of the top high school seniors in the greater San Antonio area were selected and later next month they'll get to show off their skills coming up tonight on Instant Replay. A lot of hard work going into this. It's really exciting and just like really rewarding. I feel pretty good. I'm really excited to play with some of my friends from other schools. I feel great, um, especially because I was injured for part of my season, so I feel very blessed that I was still chosen. Three weeks ago, we held the San Antonio Sports All-Star Game Media Day at the Alamo Dome, and since then, we've been highlighting the student athletes leading up to those games next month. Tonight, you'll hear from senior basketball players representing Antonian Prep and San Antonio Christian. It, it is a life-changing opportunity for these guys, and that's why we do this. That's why we're trying to, to make sure that this league is here for a long, long time. The San Antonio Brahmas of the United Football League held a kickoff event at the Alamo Dome this afternoon. Brahmas head coach Wade Phillips was there, as was UFL head of football operations Daryl Moose Johnson. k Central Sports Nick Mantis was there, and he has more as Brahmas fans are getting excited for the upcoming season, and that includes our very own Courtney. Now, we've also got NBA All-Star game that went down tonight, and we'll recap 
Wimby and Jeremy's time in Indianapolis. It was snowing while we were there. Plus, SAFC played a match as they get ready for the 2024 campaign. That and much more coming up in a few moments on Instant Replay. I feel like you brought that cold weather in with you. <laughs> oh, you're blaming me. Thanks. <laughs> he flew in from Indy today, okay? Well, it was I, cold before I didn't realize that. it was that cold here, honestly. Yeah, you don't get to take the jacket. Don't forget your hat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back after this.